I please get a thumbs up in the chat to let me know that you can see the screen? You are the, good. Yo, I'll apologize in advance if you hear my neighbors mowing the lawn or my dog barking at squirrels. It's uh, it's this is life working from home, but. Good day to all of you and. Thank you for taking time out to come to my session called uh, building the ultimate issue tracker using Microsoft Teams, Microsoft Lists and Power Automate. <clears throat> this talk is uh, uh, largely inspired by a, uh, a number of uh, blog posts that I had uh, um, put together over the, the past year around uh, uh, patterns that, uh, with Power Automate and lists that I was finding in my, uh, my working life. And uh, I, I thought it would be interesting just to keep stacking up uh, all of these, uh, these different uh, forms and, and functionality on, on top of uh, a basic list to to showcase how you can extend uh, um, some of these out of the box uh, uh, templates that we now get with Microsoft lists and to showcase uh, the types of interesting things that you can do with uh, with Microsoft Power Automate and and all in the context of, uh, of Microsoft Teams where we, we find ourselves working uh, uh, and our colleagues uh, in the workforce and the rest of the world and even in the virtual classroom like my kids are doing next door in teams so it's uh, i hope that you'll get uh, some good value out of the session i also hope that you'll be inspired to use lists and power automate uh, in, in the way of a quick introduction my name is norm young i'm from ontario canada and i live in a small town called st catharines and it's okay if you don't know where st catharines is but to give you a reference point, uh, as I look out my window, uh, I can see the mist coming out from Niagara Falls. And uh, if I look out the, the window behind me, I can see Toronto uh, over Lake Ontario on the horizon. So I, I'm in between places and uh, I'm neither uh, uh, bogged down by a big city or, or tourism. So it, it's quite nice uh, of a place to live. Um, I'm a Microsoft MVP in the Office Apps and Services space, and uh, I'm currently working at a company called Unlimited Biz. Uh, it's okay if you haven't heard of us. We're a, uh, a software company. We make a product called Tigraph, and we do uh, usage analytics. So that's me in a nutshell, and this will be my third time um, talking uh, to this user group. So it's it's a it's a great pleasure. Last year, I had the opportunity to speak at the admin workshop with a. Uh, uh, a good friend, Hugo Bernier, about um, about when use list versus uh, Dataverse for Teams versus Dataverse, and then I had the opportunity to do one of the user groups. So happy to be here because this is one of the most organized groups I've ever encountered, and it's a it's always a pleasure. So, thank you everyone for having me today, and thank you to all of our sponsors for making this event possible. So. The first thing that we're going to do is I'm going to show you how easy it is to get started with Microsoft lists inside of Teams. And then I'm going to show you how you can start extending that functionality using Power Automate. And this particular demo was inspired by some things I was doing at my previous job. And I used to work in higher education at a university. And we were managing case information. And lots and lots and lots of metadata had to be tracked about these cases. and. Uh, Yes, the list could have an attached document, but it added too much user friction to the user experience. So they wanted to work inside the native SharePoint library, but they didn't want to have to search for all of the content in the documents that we made. So we, in this demo, we will show how you can, sounds very simple, but create a folder using Power Automate based on metadata in the list, and then have a, a friendly, link, if you will, uh, in the list for users to be able to go through, click on, find the content that they need. So let's get right into it. Um, again, this is, uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat. I'm watching both here uh, and and uh, feel free to come off mute. So here we are, we're in Teams, we're adding the list app and it creates it as a new tab. So this is great. We have our users working in the context where they're used to. In this case, for the issue tracker, we're using one of these new templates that come out of the box with Microsoft lists. 
And the templates give you this nice view of all of the columns and the functionality that you can expect to use in the list. It's very simple. You give it a name. You could even pick a color. You could pick an icon and you click create. And in a few moments, you get to start with something. And I think this is incredibly value, valuable, excuse me, to our users. Give them something to build upon. But inside of Teams, Microsoft List does not have all of the features that you would expect. As I'm clicking through, you see that Teams just is a, doesn't have the same feature parity. So what I'm going to do is open up the list for this work inside of the native experience. So by default, it pops into SharePoint. You'll see that I put on this, uh, this bit of code to the end of the URL and it pops it into uh, the Microsoft List experience. And so I'm just copying the, the URL because I'm going to have to use it repeatedly inside of uh, Power Automate. And so the first thing that I want to do is to create a column that will store the URL to the folder that we're creating. It seems very simple what I'm doing right now. I'm just adding a folder. If we rewind the clock to last year, you wouldn't have done this on the front end of the list. You would have to go into list settings. So what we're seeing is this, this uh, investment from Microsoft into modernizing the list experience. And it's, it's quite exciting because a lot of people will use lists for their business data. I've gone into Power Automate, and now I'm going to create a new flow. And this is an automated flow, which means that on a certain event trigger, this thing will just run. It doesn't go on a timer. It, it doesn't get called by a button. This is just something, it's event driven. So I give it a name and I'm using the trigger when it says, whenever a new SharePoint item is created, launch this Power Automate flow. And so the first thing that I will do to all of these actions, and it will probably be very boring for me to watch and perhaps even painful at times because I'm one of the world's slowest typers, is that I'm going to rename every action so I don't get lost in a sea of other actions that are doing the same thing. So I will uh, paste in the site name. I will identify the list that we're using. And now I'll add a new action. And I'm going to create a new variable. And this will store the folder name. I'd be curious to know from the people that are attending today, are you using Microsoft lists in your work? And I'd be also curious to know how you're using it. Are you using it for tracking, for integrations? It'd be really interesting to see what you have to say. Please feel free to put it in the chat window. And so at this point, I'm making a, 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 a a concatenated string of metadata, and I'm, I'm saying, give me the ID from the uh, the list, and we're going to append uh, some strings to it. And uh, sky's the limit to what you can do here with the dynamic data. You could have a, a business readable type of uh, ID numbers that would say like a code or a business acronym and the numbers. And so this 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 may not be that important to us on the IT side, but users having that business readable ID might be important to them. And you can do this uh, with the, the variable operations that we do. And so Tim, you're using it to track blogs and social media posts. Oh, that's very interesting. Uh, I've thought about doing something similar. I'm using a service right now, but I have thought of going to list. So Tim, are you using the uh, the out of the box one that comes delivered with lists or did you create your own? And in back into the demo, we see that uh, we're going back to the site. I'm targeting the document library. And then I'm going to, okay, now we're in teams, right? So I have to put in what channel this is going to. So in this case, I'm just hard coding it because I'm going to general channel. There'd be other ways of dynamically putting this in and then Excellent. And uh, I put in the folder name. So when we come into Teams, it'll be sitting in our channel and that could be adjusted however you see fit. Still using this in general. Yeah, OK, very good, Brian. That's good to hear. And Tim is saying pretty much my own. Oh, very good. Um, and Rhonda, yes. 
That's very interesting, Rhonda. And Rhonda, are you using the template that comes delivered? And so I'm going to do a, a test. And so what I'm doing here, I hope it seems very basic because it, it, it really is. Like I'm not doing anything too high tech here. So I'm going to initiate a, a test of this by creating a new item. We're just calling it a test issue. The hard part is the writing back to the list of the URL. Uh, the URL is just output metadata that we can use, but giving it a friendly name, that is a different story and that takes a bit more work. So great, we have our folder. It's created based on the metadata variable that we put together. Well, that's awesome. That's really good, Carrie. That's interesting to hear. Um, the hard part is I want to have in my list, not this big long SharePoint URL, I want something that is small on the screen so my users can get more real estate. I want something that is friendly, something that will be in reinforced to them should they go visually navigate it. So in, in this case, I'm going to do something a little more advanced. Uh, this is the, the send an HTTP request to SharePoint. Now this action is emulating the, the, the Microsoft graph actions that you could take using something like PowerShell or custom code. And, and in this case, I'm going to send that, that, uh, that uh, update statement back to my list with a link description, which will be the folder name from the variable we created and the actual link. And it'll be something that's clickable. So my users, as they come through the list and think of this at scale when we have lots and lots of entries. Um, it'll be very friendly for them to click on. It won't take up much real estate and it'll be very functional. Very interesting. Yeah, it's, it's great to hear that uh, people are using it. Um, of course, it has its limitations, list that is, and uh, uh, knowing when to use it and when not to use it can be, uh, can be problematic. And so uh, as I'm, as the demo is running, we see that uh, we're sending a post command to the SharePoint site. Um, we've had to use a function called get by title. So this is the issue tracker name. And then we are going right down into the ID level so we can affect that particular row. And then we'll pass in the rest of the, the parameters that are required. So this header business is just pretty standard. The body is where it's a bit different. And so uh, I'll paste in uh, some static text from the side and then I will put in the dynamic values. Uh, if you're a developer and you're used to, to using Graph API, this is probably a piece of cake for you. If you're not a developer like myself, uh, this type of thing is important. So uh, let me pause for a quick sec. Uh, we have this, this body statement that is sending in and so, okay, you can read there's the metadata we're passing in. Uh, we're doing stuff to the issue tracker list item. Well, what the heck is that? If you look at the command we previously sent in the URI, it's issue tracker. So when we created our list, it was issue space tracker, right? So behind the scenes, SharePoint doesn't know what to do with the blank. So it puts in this underscore X 0020 underscore. Uh, people who do anything with uh, uh, Power Apps or other tools in the Power Platform are probably used to seeing this as spaces. But knowing what your list is called internally when using the send HTTP uh, request to SharePoint, it's important to know. And I'll show you how you can get that out. And so you see the description is the folder name. The description will be like that, that vanity URL that we'll see in the list. And then the link to the item is what is uh, uh, spit out from the uh, create new folder, the issue tracker. So I've highlighted that uh, the, the, the list name again, and I'm highlighting the difference. Uh, I can't remember in this demo if I'm uh, showing the URL or not. Yeah, so here is just reinforcing in, in a web experience. Um, a space will, will show up as percent 20, but behind the scenes in, uh, in SharePoint, it's stored internally. It's going to be that, that X underscore business. So what I'm doing here, and hopefully I can get to my speaker notes, and I'll put this into the chat window because I, I find this one incredibly handy. Oh, I'm sorry. 
it's still re resume slider. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to pop up that. I'm just trying to get my notes on this. I want to put them in the chat window because I found this particularly um, valuable as I was doing these demos. And so it says, uh, there we go. Sorry about that, folks. And here with this, this kind of crazy command, you can see the uh, you can see you can get that internal name from that command. So uh, what I just pasted into the chat window, if you put that uh, get title and then that, that command at the end, it will tell you what your internal list name is. And that can be important when you're using um, uh, the, the send HTTP request to SharePoint with, um, uh, with a list with a space in it, excuse me. So here we go, we're just finishing this up making sure that uh, I've got this all formatted correctly. I'm using dynamic data. And then when we fire this off, uh, the folder's already been created because we tested, uh, but we're going to get it right back to the list, and that's going to have that folder name stored in the folder name column that we created. So here we go, we're ready to test. So, uh, my my new friends on the call that are using lists, are you also using Power Automate to uh, to automate some of the uh, the actions or the or the processing in the list? So here we go. We see the folder location. We get this very nice uh, named URL, and we click to it. We come right to uh, our target location, and uh, you really wouldn't think it would be this hard, but uh, it, it it really is a little bit of extra work to get that right back on that, that issue to, to the list. So um, at scale, this becomes incredibly important. So imagine your list um, is very much like the list I have on the screen now, and it's full of metadata that, uh, that, that, that reflects a business process. Um, and then you that business process in turn has any number of documents that uh, that might be associated to it. So again, at scale with you know hundreds of these things potentially on the screen, having that definitive link back to the storage location uh, creates a type of uh, guardrail for our users and uh, uh, makes it so they don't have to visually navigate through. So very good. Any questions with any of that before I jump into our next one? So Christine says she she uses Power Automate with her list. That's interesting. What is the uh, what is the type of workflow that you, uh, you you tend to use with your your lists? Thank you, Brian. So I showed how easy it is to create a list, um, but sometimes we need to get outside data into a list. Um, if you're going to start from an Excel spreadsheet and then move to SharePoint. There's a feature where that will allow you to create your list from Excel, and that's great. But sometimes, whether it's because you're taking data from like an ERP system, for example, or you have a, a repeated integration of data that's going in, you can import data into lists after the list has been created. And so I, in my, my previous working life, uh, I was taking integration data out of an ERP, just like I described, and moving it into a list for, for further action. So it, it's actually a, a, a pretty straightforward uh, a flow, and, and really it's just a, it's a matter of making sure that your list and Excel line up, but there's a but, and the but is around dates. And so we have another question. Uh, do lists still have the 5,000 item limitations they traditionally had in, in SharePoint? And Christina rightly says, yes, they do. They can store millions of records. You just can't get them out with a single call to the list. But there's ways around that. You could filter. What I mean by that is create a, a view that is pre-filtered to only give the record set that you need. There's ways around it, but you need to, to understand those going in. Uh, so, right. Uh, right now, I'm uh, I'm creating a due date column, 
and I'm putting some column formatting around it. Due date is one of those things that is so very important to most business processes when we're tracking issues. It's not in the, the delivered template, but I'm adding it here because it will be the, the anchor point for some of the other work that we do. So I'm going through the steps of, uh, of creating a, uh, a conditional formatting rule uh, where if we're past the due date and the issue is still open, which are all of these different conditions that I'm specifying. So I, it reads uh, uh, the due date is before today. The status is new. If the status is blocked. The status is in progress. That means it's still open. Then let's flag our condition. And so what we'll do now is we'll try and make this uh, very visually obvious to our users when they come in. So you can see this example I put in, it's going to be this very bold red. So this was the first part. I needed to get my columns in my list aligned to my columns in the spreadsheet. So this is the first part of the activity that we do. And I'm just going through to test the, uh, the conditional formatting. So I'll change it to blocked and that's still good. And we can see that we have this great functionality built into the list. If I put it into complete, the bold should go away and it's done that. So I'll just reset this before we jump into Power Automate. So it, the conditional formatting is working as it is. If you're, if you're not used to conditional formatting um, or you've come to it recently, you'll see that I was using the uh, um, the, the front end to click through it. Uh, rewind a year and a half ago, uh, you were doing that with JSON code. And uh, for me, that is, that's a barrier. Like, I don't know, JSON, I try and read it, and I can barely do it. Um, and so uh, uh, having that, that, con that condition, that, sorry, that conditional formatting in a, in a, in a friendly way to do it, it's just so incredibly valuable. And then you can use it to highlight what's important. And so, at this point, as we're getting, we know that the column definitions now match between the spreadsheet and the list. So what I want to do is just call out one very important thing. It has to be a table. You'll notice that the, the table design word is highlighted. The list has to be a table. Or sorry, the, the data in the spreadsheet has to be a table in order for it to be um, uh, consumed by Power Automate and then moved into our list. So we're good there. We have our list. The list and the and the the, the Excel data, uh, the column structures they match. So let's hop into Power Automate and create another flow. So this time I'm going to create a uh, a scheduled flow, and all that simply means is this running on a timer. So think of the those those. Um, daily output jobs from your ERP. You pick up that uh, export file and then you, you import it in. This is the, the type of uh, pattern that we're showing here. So our first step will be to connect to the Excel spreadsheet in our team site and then interrogate all the data that exists. So I have to get my URL again of the underlying site. And uh, it's, it doesn't seem to remember all of the sites I'm currently using, and I don't know if it's um, activity-based or whatever the, 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 the technology that drives the, the recent sites you're using, but I can never seem to find what I'm looking for without having to use the, the custom option. And so you can see I've gone into the site, I've gone into the shared documents document library. I'm in the general folder for our channel. We have the issue tracker uh, data because there was a table. It knew to find that table. And now I'm just going through a, a bit of a rename here. And so I called out dates earlier. This is the, the, the but to it. And dates uh, get stored differently in Excel and have to be converted, if you will, to get uh, properly inserted into SharePoint. So we had two date columns. We had uh, uh, date reported and due date. So we'll have to have uh, two variables to store those values. Once we get into the work of looping through the data in the Excel spreadsheet, yeah, the Excel spreadsheet, excuse me, and then 
doing inserts or creating items into the uh, into the SharePoint list. So we're creating our uh, we've created our first date reported uh, variable. Now we're going to create our next one, which will be uh, due date. And again, uh, we have two two actions. So in this case, that they're they're excuse me, they're uh, the variables, initialized variables. Uh, if they were named initialized variable one, initialized variable two, you may not know what that means. So um, this is the rationale and the, of why we go through the effort to rename things uh, so you don't get lost or the person coming in behind you doesn't get lost in, in what you're doing. And so uh, this is uh, simply using the values from the Excel spreadsheet as the basis for the loop. And now we're going to take the date values and convert them into our variable. So we'll do a set command. And we'll do var date reported. This is where it gets uh, a bit tricky. This, uh, this particular command is and you, you'll see this when I do the actual insert. It's it, it's not pretty. And it's one I'll take no credit for uh, for finding. It's you know it's the type of stuff you find uh, using your favorite search engine and on the community sites. And. Yeah, bear with me as I'm the world's slowest typist. And sorry, folks, I hit pause. Didn't mean to do that. So there's our due date. And now we'll just do the uh, the SharePoint create item. So we'll insert our new row. Connected to the site and the list, and then it's a simple mapping exercise. I'm just going to jump ahead just a little bit. I think you'll the mapping piece is fine. The part that is there's two things here to note. You'll, you'll notice that, uh, let me rewind it just a quick sec. You'll notice that the uh, the status value, it already has the, the default value. And so you need to ensure that you override that when you are doing your insert to take the value that it was actually expecting. So we're talking about default values in the list. You have to make sure you're overriding that default value and putting the, the value from the list. So I'm going to just jump ahead. And so again, uh, this is all just simple one-to-one -one mapping, but this is where it gets a bit different. So now we're putting in our first date. And so the first thing that we have to do is to add days to that Excel value. And so we're going to add, uh, based on this date of 1899, December 30th, we're going to convert the value of our variable date. So I'll just jump over to the dynamic column. Click date reported. And the last bit I'll do is to format it uh, in, a, in a way that makes sense. Sorry, I'm just making sure because some of these get a bit complicated. And I got a typo, so glad I caught that one. And that one should be good now. And it's a rinse and repeat pattern for due dates. So you you add from the days that Excel stores. So I presumably Excel 
dates are based on that uh, 1899 December 30th date. And then you move forward from there. So this is really the uh, the, the hardest part, if you will, of uh, taking data from Excel and moving it into uh, a list. So I convert my, uh, my, my string variable, and then I do a format, and it should be good to go. I can skip ahead here. OK, good. This one to one exercise is complete. I don't have to put it in the folder location because it hasn't been created and we have our initial flow will do it for us. So we'll give it a test. It's going through uh, each row in that uh, spreadsheet. Uh, it's it's putting uh, the dates into variables. Uh, it does a create item statement, and that's why it takes uh, you know like 23 seconds. And if we hop into our lists, we'll see that all of the data has been entered in uh, from this spreadsheet. And you saw that it just refreshed on the screen as it um, executed the create folders. And so uh, essentially two, two flows took off for every create item. And uh, now we can see the, the value of, uh, of creating our folder location. It, it's all there, it's, it's very readable. Those are unique folder names. They will uh, um, be good for our users. We also see that the due date column that we created, it has uh, uh, a visual attention drawn to those items that are expired. And the nice thing is you see all the functionality that comes delivered with this, this issue tracker list. The status column, uh, it lets me know where I'm good and where I'm not good. Uh, even the assigned to column, that person column, that, that, that nice friendly image uh, to let me know who I'm working with. Uh, lots of value in this list. And really the, the, the ultimate, uh, the, the ultimate anything that we do in, in, in Microsoft 365 is to uh, extend functionality. So this next flow, um, oh, excuse me. This next flow uh, is targeted at this days old column that comes with the, with the issue tracker. And as we'll see, it is, uh, it's based on a SharePoint calculated column. And that's fine until you get to the point where the, the issue is considered closed. Uh, that days old will still continue to calculate. And so we'll do our own. We will create a, uh, uh, a new days old calculation and we will copy the column formatting from the existing one because it, it works well when it's over a certain threshold. Um, it, it gets visually highlighted so you, you know that this is an area that needs uh, attention. But in this case, we will add more logic to uh, to the days old and we will say that uh, we'll only calculate it to the point where the status is no longer considered open. And so now you're able to see the age of an issue uh, while it was an issue. Again, the, the previous one works quite well, but I think the, the assumption there was that you, you would potentially remove an item uh, either from the view or from the list, and so it wouldn't be uh, an ongoing thing. So uh, we're going back into our friend's Power Automate, and we'll be doing uh, uh, additional calculations to uh, to do that days old. And uh, you will see when it finishes, um, you will see that uh, uh, for those for those uh, issues that are closed, they won't have they won't have any calculations uh, applied to that new days old column. So you have to run this every day to be effective. So every day, let's say once in the morning, it calculates the day, uh, the age, and then the next day it'll go in. Is it open, closed? If so, let's update the date. So here we go. Um, we're going to, to start by uh, creating a, a variable. Excuse me while I get a drink. And we're going to use the uh, the date reported as the, the basis of the calculation. Okay. 
So I keep doing that. Sorry, I keep clicking onto chat, and whenever I do that, it stops the the playback on the uh, the presentation. Uh, I would have loved nothing more than to have done all of these uh, these live, but I don't trust myself not to uh, to make mistakes and get too flustered. Um, uh, and and I, unfortunately, I've seen it where it hasn't worked out for presenters, and I think it's safer to to pre-record the demos. Um, I can tell you that uh, any any flow pattern that I've ever created, it rarely works right the first time. So if you're left with the impression that um, you just create all of these and they they run right the first time, that's that's not true. That's Hollywood. Um, there's always trial and error in these things. So I'm doing a get items, and so what I'm doing is. I'm retrieving all of the items in the list that are only open. And so in the case of the issue tracker, there's multiple values that we can consider open. And so we see in progress, open, new, open, blot, that's considered open, excuse me. And so we'll have a, a data set that's only applicable to the changes that we're doing. And so now I'll go into a loop, which is this apply to each command, and I'll use the output from the get item. So, um, we're not interrogating the whole list or running it against the whole list. We're just going against those items that are, are uh, captured by those conditions, that OData uh, filter that we specified in the get items. And so that's the, the value that I'm specifying here. And now I'm going to use that variable date reported. And I'm going to set it for use inside of the uh, the update item that we'll do after this step. So we declared it, now we have to assign it while we're inside of the loop. Flow doesn't let you, you know, initialize a variable inside of the loop, you have to do it at, at the above. So we've assigned it and now we'll do the update item and then we have another uh, bit of an odd calculation that I'll take no credit for, but I have used it. Um, it uses a function called ticks. No, I don't think you can, Brian. Um, I, I do remember trying to uh, I was looking at this recently. I'm just trying to remember the details. But you know, don't quote me on that. That's something I can take away. And I will get back to you. Calculated columns are, are, are really cool, but they, they don't get fully exposed uh, into the other workloads because they're because they are dynamic. Yeah, I'm 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 so very certain that I was helping someone work with a flow recently and the calculated column couldn't come in, and that's what we were doing. The, in that case, the user had uh, heavy business logic uh, evaluating the state of uh, the metadata and the calculated column would dynamically say if it was like high risk, low risk and so on. Um, and then we ended up moving that work into uh, into Power Automate, very much like we're doing here, where we're once a day we, we assess the state of things and we go. So here's this weird calculation. I'm doing a division, a subtraction, a ticks function. We're using the UTC now function, which is Today's date, we're formatted into a, a, a format that makes sense for our list. It is a piece of work. And I promise I, I did not make this up. I'm not smart enough to do that, but I am smart enough to find that on, uh, on Google and uh, in the Power Automate community space. <clears throat> that ticks business is a, a function that is calculating uh, the, the seconds, I believe, from uh, uh, a certain date that is stored inside of uh, Excel. And doing that formula gives you the, the date difference. So here we go. We're running through. Um, we've got our list, our sub list of items. And then if we look in, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll see that the items that are open get the calculation. The ones that are closed, they get nothing. So uh, let's say uh, a new this this test issue at the very top, it's days old is 14, tomorrow goes to 15. Uh, we close it the day after, it will not tick over to 16. So 
Pretty cool. And I was surprised at how hard, not hard, but how much work was involved to uh, to stop that uh, that days old calculated column from uh, from continuing to move over. And it was my first reaction just to to manipulate the calculated column, but it was just it was not happening. Happy to answer any questions as I can at the end of these. So feel free to, to post them in the chat. Um, this next pattern is. Uh, again, it came from a, a, a real world situation that I, I encountered at my previous job and we had. Uh, we had a uh, case information that was going from uh, a short term state to a long term state and the, the business processes in the short term uh, did not line up exactly to the business process in the long term state. So uh, as it transitioned over, uh, it didn't make sense to rekey in the long term information into the long term list. Uh, it made more sense to move that item from short term into long term and then uh, dynamically um, or manually, depending on the particular case, populate that information. So um, I did I did do this at, at one point where I put like a almost like a physical button on the list item. It was a link and that would kick off a flow, but uh, it's easier to use the, the, the out of the box configuration and that's what we'll show here. So this is really a useful pattern for for moving data, especially when it is stateful. Uh, short term, long term state. So let's take a look at how this pattern came together. And so we need another list to send it to. And so we're going to create a new list, but we're going to use the existing list that we just created. Um, so you can reference any list that you have access to. And that can be your, your starting point. Uh, in the, the real world example, I said like. Uh, uh, this was kind of how it was developed in the first place, and so it was just, a, you know, reflecting the business process in the, in the list columns. And so here we. Uh, we're, we're creating it based on the existing issue tracker. I'll put it in the the team site. I'll give it a, a new name, a new color. So we have a question. Uh, would the people getting assigned tasks from access the info from lists, or would you use this within a team? I think it depends on your users and where they're most comfortable. But in this context, I want everything in the teams, and I will. I'll show you uh, later in 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 the session how you can. There's a couple of different ways where you can engage your users. Uh, so, in my in my current work, we use list for for process management and uh, I preferred in the list experience and others on my team preferred in teams because that's just where they are all day. My bias is because I like the the additional features that you get in lists, but most users consuming the information they don't need it. So uh, I created a, a, a new uh, flow and this time it, instead of a, a, a date like a scheduled or a uh, an action that initiates uh, the execution I'm, I'm doing for a selected item and essentially it's a button um, think of the list and you, if you want to select an item there's a that round check circle when you click that we are going to be able to call uh, any flow that has been associated with that list and it will execute with all of that information from that list item. So it's just like a button that you would put on a power up. First thing that you need to do is to get all of the information from that list. It doesn't give you everything when you click it. It just gives you some of the, the minimum metadata. So think of like your ID. That was, a, that was a great question, Tark, and I, I do think that you have to know your audience in that one, but uh, placing it in teams is uh, a no brainer. Uh, even if the list doesn't physically live in that underlying SharePoint site in the team, it can still be added to it as long as they have uh, access to, to get to it. So uh, 
I've done the get item. So what I've basically said is it's it's just a full retrieval of all of the, the row information. And now I'm going to create a new item. And so I'm starting to call things like source, and now I'm going to call them destination just to help uh, visualize the, the flow of the, of the data. So it, it's very much like all of the other things that we've done where we, we're just doing this one for one lineup of uh, source column information to destination information. And then we'll just have a cleanup tab task at the end of it. So we're still doing good for time. So I'm just going to. There's nothing fancy in the. Uh, in the this, this lining up of values, it's just kind of one for one mapping type things. Um, you will see that I made the mistake of using the claims information. So even though the action wants me to put in claims, uh, you have to put in the, the email. Dates are straightforward because they're SharePoint, as long as you know what you're lining up. Issue source, this is a, a URL. And, and you can see in this situation, uh, if I just rewind just a quick sec, like I've got all of these SharePoint items, it's so easy to, uh, to confuse the output from one action to another, and I know I've been burned on that. There we go, just uh, sign to email or issue log by. Save that. And then we'll remove the row, right? It's, we have to get it out of the list. It, it no longer belongs there, but we only do that after we've confirmed that it's moved over. So SharePoint delete item, uh, we'll target this towards uh, source, And we'll use the uh, the ID column that uh, was given to us when the 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 flow was uh, initiated from the the button press, if you will. And so, like the great example, three IDs. If I didn't rename them, it would you know human error could get in the way. So I will save. I will go into my source list. And I will pick this duplicate one as an example. And then as I go up to the automate menu, we'll give it a second. And it retrieves the flow and knows it's associated to it with it. So as I click it, it pops up this menu on the right hand side. Permissions, continue, all that type of stuff. Run the flow. And then on the background, that flow is executing. It's retrieving the information. It's writing it to the new list. And then it's going to delete it in the source. So it just shows up, which is great. All my information's there. And if I refresh, the item goes away. And we'll check the flow history and we'll see that that all worked out well. And so uh, I don't know if anyone saw it. It's. Uh, you, you'll notice that. Um, the folder location went back to the. The original URL, it's because I didn't use that that send HTTPS uh, action, so it. It's not the end of the world to have it like this, but it is not the. Uh, it's not the friendliest user experience, but in this case, we're just archiving out duplicates in this case, so I don't care. Uh, so it may have taken additional work, but we have that work uh, in the previous demo that we did. But that's why went through all that effort of using the. Of getting that link description created versus just letting it be that long URL. If I expanded the column of that folder location, it would like it would be huge on the screen and. Uh, not everyone's got you know big screen real estate, so uh, very interesting. And uh, used that one quite a few times in the real world. And so let's 
get to the next item. So, um, you, uh, most of us have probably heard of or seen or have used Power Apps and all the other uh, uh, awesome tools that exist in the Power Platform. And when uh, when I first started using List a number of years ago, the uh, the only option to to customize the form was to go into into Power Apps and that was great for me. I was in IT and I liked learning new things, but I didn't think that was the best experience for users using that Power App. It had a different look and feel. The load time was just a little off. Um, it incurred technical debt that I, I had to maintain for my users. My users are not going to pick up Power Apps. I know Power Apps can be easy, but the users I'm used to working with they look to IT to do this, so uh, my preference whenever possible is to configure a solution and not build a, a solution. So the, the theme of, of this talk is extending functionality. So uh, we've been creating columns um, to this list. We They, they may not make uh, sense the way they show up by default behind the scenes, and so there's been all of these great investments uh, in these these default forms that come with lists, and so you get uh, the new edit form is the the default forms that I'm talking about, and we have uh, quite a few new options that are are very interesting and can make for a compelling experience. And the out of the box experience by itself is great, but uh, you notice like my folder location is at the bottom, the due date is on the bottom, like it's not in the sequential order that the business process reflects in. So I would like to change that around. So I simply, like I could use Power Apps, but I'm not going to. I can just edit the columns. And we have this select, deselect, drag and drop, rearrange experience. And you'll notice there's a, uh, a vertical ellipse beside each column name. This is, uh, this is where those other conditional uh, settings exist. Where I could say uh, if today, if if the due date is less than today, hide this column, for example. So here in this very simple thing I did, I just move things around. This is all front end driven. I'm just configuring something that works for my users. So that was the first option. Uh, there's more that I could do to, to make this look more than an Excel spreadsheet on steroids. This new option, which came out recently, is configuring the layout. And so we have the ability now to inject uh, JSON formatting into that, that form. And again, we're this isn't this is going to look like developer type stuff, but this is literally what I've done and, and what I do. Like I go to uh, uh, a site like this, this is from the docs.microsoft.com, copy the sample, go into that form and extend the functionality. And docs.microsoft.com is not the only uh, source of these types of things. Um, the I believe the kickoff talk was from um, uh, a group talking about the uh, uh, the PMP practices and patterns and that community uh, uh, efforts that they're making to get people involved and to share their stuff. Oh, there's a whole site dedicated to to this type of, of work, and it's so easy to get this stuff and to uh, um, extend what others have done. Uh, so here, you you simply see that I'm I did a cut and paste. Uh, I renamed it to to suit my list. And I'm just making the, the smallest changes that make sense, like icon. I don't want a group icon. I want it to be uh, issue tracking or whatever the icon is called. And that is just simply me go, knowing that by going to whatever website Microsoft has that tells me what all of the fluid icons are. And so, you know, just with, was that a minute worth of effort? I've brought in uh, more polish to this, this interface. Uh, and my users now think that they have this system that I built for them, and I didn't build anything. I just configured something. Uh, the important part is the the data, the business process, 
and uh, I'm doing these things to make the the usability better for them. So now I'm going to adjust the body of the uh, of the form. So this is the body that we're seeing now, and I'm just going to uh, rearrange things that uh, make it easier for them to consume. Like if you're like me, you probably have a list with like two or three dozen columns in it. It's pretty hard to to view and to consume in a meaningful way uh, vertically uh, in a long listing or horizontally in one way. So if I can group them into this view, it's it's easier for me to read. Uh, I've broken it down in this case by details, state dates, just, you know, big buckets, if you will, of the different areas. It's easier to consume and it's easier to work with. And Microsoft can upgrade SharePoint and lists so it's blue in the face. My configuration stands, it rolls forward. I'm not incurring any technical debt. And there's a very good chance, a really good chance that they're going to remove the, the need to use uh, the JSON code that we saw in this example and move it to that column formatting view. And so uh, this is great for me. I, I like learning something new, so that was fine, but that was not a big investment. Uh, my users, won't need to do this today. They could probably wait, and when they wait a little bit, it'll be an out-of-the-box experience that uh, everyone can use. So really powerful. Like it, we've taken something from Microsoft. They gave, they gave us an excellent starting point. We've customized it to reflect our views, and now we're just extending functionality and adding value, and that's the name of the game here. Uh, low investment on my side uh, with a high, uh, return on investment to our users. So this is the uh, this is one of the the most important patterns that uh, that we can do, um, and that is to uh, give our users uh, an opportunity to to intervene in a, in a business process when it's uh, going to expire. Um, and so I'll show a couple of different ways of uh, sending those notifications. Uh, to our users inside of Teams. So we're, we're going to jump right into Power Automate and we're going to spend a lot of time here. Um, uh, Microsoft List uh, recently released something called Rules and the rules are, are excellent. They are uh, if, then, else, or if condition, do this uh, type of uh, configurations that have a excellent uh, front end to it that people can just can set their condition and then an action takes place. The action is an email message. The email messages, they look great out of the box. Um, but again, it's email. Some people, you know, we all know them. They have like thousands of unread emails. That's not maybe the most meaningful way to, to engage someone for something that's meaningful, like a reminder. Uh, so in this case, we'll bring the messaging to them where they're working in their their team's experience. So I'm extending that uh, that that first uh, daily run um, Power Automate flow that we created that calculates the days old, and I'm uh, I'm putting in uh, two variables right now to this flow that we'll use to do the messaging. The first one is uh, num days, and that's just going to be the number of days to remind people. So in that case, it was 30 days. So any issue due in 30 days, remind me. From there, we'll create the reminder date. And so I'm using an expression and I'm adding days. So I'm adding num days, which is 30, to today. That was UTC now, and I'm formatting it in a way that makes sense. And so at this point, I'll save it. I'll test it and I'll make sure that for the purposes of the demo that I have uh, a row that reflects that date. So I'll save and test. And so uh, for my, my users that are using uh, Listen Power Automate, are you are you are you doing email based uh, communications or are you doing like teams based communications from your your power automate flows? Be curious to know what you're doing. So here I am. I'm just setting a, a test due date here 
just so we can have a, a, a real world outcome uh, from our testing. And I think this experience looks great. And that was minimum effort to get that form to look awesome. And so now we will uh, we'll do the actual command. I'm just getting my site URL again. And so now I'm going to go back to the underlying list. I'm, I'm going to find any item or items where the due date is the date that we just calculated in the VAR reminder date. Um, there is a, uh, a built-in function into, into Microsoft List, whether that's in SharePoint or the Microsoft List app. If you have a date column in your list and you go to the automate menu and just give it a moment to populate, um, I believe it's called send me a reminder, and that will build a flow based on a, a, a defined template and it will it will send it. I believe it sends it to you or sends it to another. Uh, it's very similar to the uh, request sign off, but it's pretty cool. It will build that flow for you behind the scenes, and that is a perfectly legitimate way to start building these things out. But in my case, I don't want to have a flow for for multiple things happening in one day. I want it to be consolidated. Um, and this is what we're doing here, but th there are definitely other ways. So what I've said in that particular uh, get items uh, state is give me anything that is not complete and due today. And so I'm just making sure that that came out the way I wanted. Downloading the output, it's not the most readable thing, but it does show that I got values. So I know that it did retrieve something. So we did set that date. So now we can get into the business of uh, creating another loop to go through our data set. And in the data set, we will uh, start issuing uh, our reminders. And we're going to do two different types of reminders. One is uh, very simple, but very effective. It brings uh, just the information that the users need. And then the other one is just to, to highlight the, the potential of, uh, of adaptive cards uh, in, inside of uh, uh, Power Automate and Microsoft Teams. And uh, adaptive cards are so very powerful, but they do take a, a bit of a, a learning curve to do because it, it really does seem like a, a developer type of tool. And I'll, I'll show you. Uh, uh, again, what I think is a, a very easy way to, to get started with them, just like we did with the, the form formatting. And so this first thing that we're going to do is uh, we've got our list, we've got our items that we're going to send reminders to, and we're going to take those items and send them to the, dynamically send them to the, the people that they're assigned to uh, as a chat message from Flowbot. And Flowbot is just going to show up as a, as, as, as a, a chat head inside of Teams. So this is not going to a channel. This is going to an individual user like a, an instant message. And so the recipient is going to be dynamic and we're going to get that from our reminders list and we're going to send it to the assigned to on the email. The email part is the important piece when you're doing the these Teams actions. And now I'm going to use a message. I'm going to switch it into code view and this is HTML code. Um, and I'm just pasting in uh, the commands I need. And the important part here is that I'm doing a hyperlink. And so I'm simply putting in the link to the list item. And then I'm going to put in that uh, description of the link, very much like what we did in the earlier demos. And so it'll be the title. So you, the user won't get this big, ugly URL. They're going to get the issue title, a little bit of text, dynamic uh, data where it needs to be. So here I'm using the, uh, um, I'm going to convert the uh, uh, the number of days for the reminder, and I'm just going to say your reminder is due in 30 days. And so the user will get a very uh, simplistic message, but the point is it's all they need, and it gives them a, a link or a, a quick access point to, to go do more work if they're in a position to do so but the, the underlying value is you're intervening before something happens. And so uh, we'll see that this runs through. Um, 
and I you'll see in my uh, my first tab, I've got a new chat message. And it's it's highlighted at the bottom, so issue tracker reminder, and we have that link to get right over to the item. So I, I don't have to take all these extra steps. I, I've, I've tried to reduce friction from the experience for our users. Bring the work to them. Let them work in the context in which they're working. So now the next one. This is the sending that the chat message. That's great. Um, there's there's a I'm, there is a nicer way to consume some of this information, and there's there's a it, through adaptive cards. There is uh, the ability to to really build uh, a solution where you could potentially uh, always have the users just working inside of of that uh, that chat or that that channel conversation through the the card because the card can execute other actions. What I'm showing here is going to be very simple, um, but I, I'm that's fine. We all have to start somewhere. And so what I'm doing is picking uh, an example that is going to fit my message. So I'm using this uh, this particular example, and I'm in the adaptive cards.io website. Uh, I'm removing the elements from the adaptive card sample that I don't need. And this fits what I'm going to do. And so I did a simple preview mode to see what it's going to look like. And, and just like we did with the form editing, I just copied the, the payload. And so now I'll configure the card. Now that I have that payload copied, I didn't write that JSON. I can barely spell JSON, let alone write code in it. And so I'll go back, I'll set the reminder, and then the, uh, the, the fourth um, text box that you see where the adaptive card is, uh, I'll paste in that, that, uh, that uh, sorry, that payload JSON text, like I've done now, and I'll go through the effort of editing it. You'll see stuff from the sample like pizza, beers. Well, that actually sounds pretty good right about now. But I will go into, uh, and I'm not showing it on the screen, but um, uh, I put it into a notepad, and I, I stripped out all the junk that I don't need, and I'm just, I put some placeholders in where I'm going to replace uh, that static text with dynamic. So the first thing I'm going to do is put in the title of the issue. Uh, you'll see I've got this uh, text says due in 30 days, very much like the previous message we sent. Uh, I'm going to put in another text block. It's going to be the issue description. And so now it's it's a delivery of the, the key elements from the list dynamically that will come to that card with an, with, uh, an opportunity for them to, to take other action. And I mean literally the uh, the sky's the limit with what you can do with this stuff. It's it's more about uh, skill set and the, the desire to to incur uh, this technical deck. And this is exactly what this is. There's no friendly way of building an adaptive card that I know of. Uh, there is an option if you didn't know uh, in Power Automate to turn on preview features. And if you do that, you have a different experience that you're seeing here, and it looks like you can dynamically create one and you do kind of, but it's essentially that uh, uh, adaptive cards designer website um, being surfaced inside of Power Automate. You still need to know JSON and what all those different attributes are. And so I didn't remove the previous message because I think it's important to see the difference between the two. And so uh, our first reminder, I think is is a good, a good uh, solution, but what I've created with this adaptive card was something uh, more engaging. The information uh, is uh, presented better, in my opinion. Uh, you think that, you know, that more info button, yeah, big deal, I clicked it and it opened up the list item. That could be uh, an action to a flow, kick off another activity. Uh, send a, a message. The sky's the limit for this. Uh, this is signi significantly more engaging than the previous message. Um, and, and I do think that uh, this will be the, uh, you know, the, the place where people will invest a lot of, uh, um, of their time to, to understand adaptive cards. And I'm sure adaptive cards will mature to the point where you're just configuring them and not developing them. And the, 
at that point, it's it's going to be a pretty impressive place to be in where you you don't have to have custom built applications for a lot of these business processes. The business process is king, and it's uh, reflected in something like a, a list or a, a structures inside of Dataverse for teams. They stay in teams. Uh, the, the, the process is reflected, like I said, and then these automations through Power Automate, whether they be the out of the box ones that you, you just turn on or these ones that we've configured uh, to get this, uh, th this card that we saw with so much information, uh, the potential there is huge. So we did that one. And so we're, we're getting near the end. And you know, what did we do? We, what, what I hope I did was to show how easy it is to extend that core functionality in those list templates. Um, we had a starting point and we added content and functionality that was required by our business process. And we did it without incurring a lot of debt. Uh, creating a folder at the site so my users didn't have to do it with a simple friendly link to get to it will save them time from scanning uh, through a list of different folders. We've uh, added conditional formatting to, to columns that are the anchor to the business process. And uh, we also did um, reminders. We did updated the form experience and so much more. Uh, and, and for the most part, like, 95% of what I showed today is all configuration. These tools uh, don't really require fancy licensing. They're in your toolbox, your Microsoft 365. <laughs> That's not true, Brian. Uh, there is very little technical debt. Uh, this is all configuration, and I think that's a great place to be. So. Um, 15 minutes to go and I'm so happy to answer any questions as I can. Um, thank you for uh, for attending today. I, I read the uh, the speaker schedule. There's some pretty impressive people doing some pretty impressive things. So I really appreciate that uh, everyone here came in. So please, any questions? I'm watching the chat. Feel free to come off mute. That works as well. Uh, Again, thank you for attending. Uh, you can find me, uh, here's my socials. So speaking of, do you suggest running the workflows under a service account or just under the devs account? That's a great question. And I think that if it is a, uh, a business process, it should be run under a service account uh, if you're able to do that. If it is a personal productivity one, you know, run it under your own account. There's no need to get hooked up with traditional IT and creating all this work for yourself. Uh, but yes, and uh, there, there are, you know, when you switch to a service account, there's a bit of reconfiguration inside of Flow, but I think it is a good idea. It's also, uh, it's also a bit more meaningful for users to get a message from a, let's say, a Power Automate than uh, from Joe Blow. And thank you, Michelle. Um, this is this is one of the events that uh, and, and coming to this group is is something I look forward to. Uh, I get the the monthly reminders and the speaker lineups are always awesome. And so it's uh, it's so nice to be here again. And it's uh, it's a piece of cake to participate in because everything's so well organized. So thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time. And that's the end of that.